So, um, okay, I'll, I'll get started uh, for sake of time. Um, so given the fact that I have only limited time available, I will not go into the details of the concept of accounting for resource constraints in health economic evaluations, as there is some pretty, um, well, some great literature there to, to get you started on the topic. And my main purpose for today is really to give an overview um, of uh, developing such discrete event simulation or DES models using the SIMR package. So the SIMR package was developed by Inaki, Ukar, and Bart Smates uh, with its first release on CRAN in 2015, but since it has had regular and very substantial updates. So it implements a generic uh, framework like SimPy and, and SimJulia, and it has a backend in C++ to speed things up a bit. And it takes a more, as you will see later, a process-oriented or trajectory-based um, approach to defining models and um, to allow for the inclusion of resources. It conveniently um, implements the, uh, the chaining or piping workflow that was uh, introduced by the McGritter package. And on the SIMR website, there's a lot of information as well as tutorials um, and extending packages uh, available. So that's definitely worth uh, uh, to, to have a look at. So the foundation of, of building DES models with SIMR um, are trajectories and simulations. So trajectories are defined by the trajectory function, and these represent the process through which the agents flow, which defines what events can happen, when those events happen, as well as which resources are utilized at certain places in the pathway um, and when that occurs, and as well as for how long those resources are utilized. And you can also define when certain agent attributes or variables are to be updated. So this is really like your model structure. Then the simulation environments defined using the, the simmer function, they contain the state of the system. So they define the number of agents when they arrive, so the inter-arrival times, uh, the, the, the trajectory to which they are to be simulated, um, the amount of resources or the schedule at which they become available, and the queues, um, so the waiting sort of um, waiting rooms for the resources, as well as the level of detail that you want, so the level of de uh, monitoring in the results. So I would like to illustrate this a bit further using a hypothetical case study. And this hypothetical case study, uh, we will consider uh, the, the, the sort of the, the, the topic of cochlear implants, which can result in a substantial better hearing for individuals with a hearing loss. And as a consequence, their quality of life substantially improves. So the process for getting a cochlear implant and highly simplified, of course, for the sake of this illustration, but it starts with a referral, after which there is an initial intake to check the eligibility of the individual. Then for those who are eligible, there's a series of tests and a final consult in which is discussed whether the individual actually will move forward to surgery where the implants, uh, the implants are implemented, implanted. Sorry. Then after the surgery, there's a period of recovery for the individual to get used to the new implants, after which there is a follow-up process where the individual returns every five years. And um, well, of course, at any place in the model, the individual is of, uh, of risk of background mortality via death. So the issue in this hypothetical case study is that um, there is a specific maximum number of implants or surgeries that can be performed which is two per week. So we will model time in, in weeks here. The challenge is that actually demand exceeds this capacity. So at the time that we're starting the simulation, there is a waiting period of six months. And the, the, the challenge with this waiting time is that we will model that um, as the time between the referral and the surgery increases, the benefit an individual will have from the implant decreases. So the longer the waiting time between referral and surgery, the lower the quality of life afterwards. And the objective of our simulation is that we want to simulate for five years worth of newly revered individuals, how the waiting time will develop and what the impact of the quality of life would be. But we also want to see whether some alternatives uh, might actually improve things. So we will consider two scenarios, one in which the, um, in which the capacity is increased uh, to three surgeries per week, so 50%, and 
And the other strategy is a bit more dynamic where we temporarily increase the surgery or double the, uh, the, the surgery capacity um, after which we fix it at, at three uh, surgeries per week. And I do want to acknowledge that um, this hypothetical case study was inspired by a current project that's being performed by Hugo Nijmeyer from the Radboud Universal Medical Center in the Netherlands. Um, but other than just the concept, all the parameters that are available are purely hypothetical. All right, so let's start implementing our model. So we start with the sort of model initialization at the referral. So we define our trajectory, um, trajectory main in this case. And to initialize the simulation for the individual, we record the time of referral. So we want to know when this individual was referred. And for that, we use the set attribute function. And this simply records or updates an individual level attribute, or let's say a variable. And you do so by specifying the names of the attributes and the value to which the attribute should be set. If you specify the mod um, argument, which we'll show, uh, show in a little bit more detail later, but you can also update the value. So if you leave that on an A, you sort of set the value, but if you add a mode of updating it like plus or minus, you actually can update an existing value. And that also gives a hint that all the attributes need to be numericals. So there is no characters. The names are characters, but the values are numericals. And of course, you can also set global variables that are accessible from uh, by all individuals using um, the set global function. All right, so we have stored the, the, the set attribute um, or the, the time of referral, but in do so, we use the now function. And the now function is a function to obtain the current simulation time of the simulation that's defined by the environment. So in this case, as we'll see later, our simulation is called sim. And then a second step in this initialization, we add this uh, renege in. And what that does, it basically schedules an event to happen sometime in the future. And in this case, it's background mortality. So we sample a value from a Gompertz distribution. And regardless of where the individual is in the pathway at the time of this event, it will be moved to the end trajectory, which we will define later. So that means that we that that's how we simulate background mortality in this case. So the next step is to model the intake. And this is the first sort of time where we actually consider a resource. And we model the use of resources using the seize and release um, functions to respectively seize and release resources once they are available. So we have to specify the name of the resource as well as the amount we want to seize and release. And the default for that is one, so it isn't specified here. And it's important to realize that if no resources are available, the individual enters the queue. Um, and the settings for the queue can be performed in the simulation environment as we see later. So the other thing we do here is we delay the individual using the timeout function. So after seizing the, um, the resource, we delay the individual for a certain amount of time. And in this case, the, the amount of time is defined by uh, the, the parameter that's defined in R, T underscore intake. Um, so you can perform such a timeout by specifying the task, which is the duration of time. And it's important to realize that it's, it's the modeler's responsibility to ensure that time is consistently defined throughout. So Simmer doesn't simulate in months or years or whatever, it simulates in time units. And it's your responsibility to ensure that that's consistently implemented. And if what you will often do probably is first save the time into uh, an attribute, you can directly delay the patient from an attribute using the time from attribute function. All right, next up is the branch. So as you may remember, some individuals are ineligible and they do should not continue in the pathway. Well, to implement such a branch, we use the branch function. So that function directs individuals to alternative sub trajectories. The arguments for this are the option, which basically specifies the number of the sub trajectory in the branch the individual should go to. And it continues specifying whether after completing the sub trajectory, whether the individual should stay there or whether uh, the individual should continue. 
Um, and then the, 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 like the, the, the dots uh, represent the different trajectories separated by commas. And one very um, useful feature is that if option is zero, then you actually skip the branch. And in this case, we want individuals that are eligible, which we check with this, this, uh, this function that we've defined. It's very simple, just sample a zero or a one. Um, those will continue to test. Um, but those who are not eligible, they will go to subtrajectory one. So they will end up here. And again, we then sort of save that the individual was rejected for, for, for administration purposes, and we wait. So basically we sort of hold the individual there until uh, the Renaic in um, function has triggered the event of death. Well, then to do all this, we only need the same function. Um, so we, for the testing, we seize timeout release. For the final consult, we seize timeout release. Then there's another branch for sort of the second um, uh, triage of whether individuals are eligible or not, which is very similar to the first one. We have the surgery, which we also see timeout release, but we also record the time of surgery so that later we can calculate the total time between referral and surgery. And then we have the recovery again, seize timeout release. All right. So then there's one additional important thing that, that I would like to show you, and that's the rollback. So to, um, to model the follow-up, we can do an easy seize timeout release to sort of model the event of follow-up. And what we also do here is that we use the set attribute with the mod plus argument to update the count of follow-up cycles. So every time an individual comes here, the follow-up count attribute is, is increased by one. So then after this follow-up cycle is completed, we um, hold, we time out the, the individual until the next follow-up. And then we use a rollback. And the rollback basically um, directs the individual a certain amount of steps back in the trajectory. So we have to define how far in the trajectory the individual should go back using the amount argument. And in this case, that is one, two, three, four, five. So then the individual ends up here at the C's follow-up resource. Other arguments that you can use is you can use the time argument to define a maximum number of rollbacks that are allowed, or you can um, define a function um, for the check argument that returns a true or false, indicating whether actually the rollback can be performed or not. And I know from using the similar package in the early days, you could not plot trajectories. So for complex model, it was sort of a bit of a pain to find out whether your rollback amount was right or not. Or not. But nowadays, you can easily plot your trajectory to see whether you uh, put in the right amount. And like I noted, here we use the, the mod argument to the set attribute function to update rather than set um, the value. <clears throat> All right, so that was our main trajectory. Now, um, very quickly, our end trajectory. So what we want to do here is just simply record some like of the outcomes. And um, we do so using an, another function, uh, calculate impact. And this function has two arguments. So this current simulation time, and we've already discussed the now argument, but also some patient level attributes, individual level attributes. Um, and we can read those attributes that we have set or updated previously using the get attribute function. And this is quite similar to the set attribute function um, in that we have to apply course, define um, the names of the attributes, the keys of the attributes that we want to get the values from. And we have to specify the similar environment in which those um, variables are being mo um, monitored. And well, like the set global, there's also the get global to extract the values of um, global uh, attributes. Um, and this also shows how you can set or read multiple uh, attributes at once. One very important thing with trajectories is um, the, the difference between static and dynamic function calls. So if you do anything in a trajectory without the function statement, the expression is only evaluated one time when the trajectory is defined. So let me illustrate that. So if you have a timeout with a random draw from a Weibull distribution and you do not specify function, 
one draw is performed when you define the trajectory. So every individual will have that, that same value. Whereas if you use the, the function statement here, you sort of tell Simmer that, oh, this is the function you have to evaluate every time. So in the bottom case, for every individual, a, a different value will be sampled. So that's an important thing to know. And then some other useful function are join to sort of glue trajectories together and the log function, um, which allows you to print messages to the console. And it's very useful for debugging. And there's heaps of other things um, to, to look to at the, at the website, but I think these are the most important ones. All right, so we've defined our trajectory. So now it's time to actually run the simulation. So we define our sim, our, our simmer environment, our simulation, and we add the resources. And for adding the resources, we have to specify the names and they, those of course have to match with the names you use in the trajectory. Uh, we have to define the capacity um, and the queue size. Well, the queue size is in infinite by default, um, but the capacity is one by default. So in our example, we only have a, a capacity constraint for the surgery, so all the others are infinite. And for the surgery, we want to define a schedule. Because we had this existing six month waiting period, we only open up this resource after six months or 26 weeks. So at time zero, we want zero capacity. And at time 26, we put it to two, which was our scenario one. So then the last thing we have to do before we can run the simulation is add actually the individuals. So using the generator, we can specify how individuals are to be simulated through a certain trajectory. Just so two minutes can, current. Yeah. So we can specify a, a prefix for the name, the trajectory they have to go to, and their sort of inter-arrival time, um, as well as the level of monitoring. So how much detail do we want in the outputs? And then that's typically the, the highest level of detail, which is two. And in this case, I use the two argument to only simulate for five years. Uh, according to a, a simple um, well, exponential distribution for the interrived rates. So then we can run our simulation and extract the attributes, the arrivals and resources from the, the simulation environment. And as you can see on the right, the resulting data frames are in long format. Um, so for every individual, for everything that happens, there is a row, which is great in level of detail, but usually we only just wanna have for our final outcomes, a row per individual. So in the code, you also find this custom function that conveniently summarizes um, uh, the, the monitored attributes into the last recorded value per individual. All right, so let's have a look at what it then looks, for, um, looks like for our case study. So remember our strategies. Um, we had a, a waiting period of six months, so this was the schedule for the, the surgery resource for strategy one. Then for the strategy two, we changed the two to a three. And for strategy three, we um, doubled the capacity for the first two years. So it's four, and then after two and a half years, we put it to three. So as we can see here, so this is the mean time to surgery in years um, for scenario one, it continues to increase. And for scenario two, it slowly decreases over time. But for the third scenario, you can see a steep decrease and at a certain time it, it stays stable. And that has a profound impact on the quality adjusted life years. Um, of course, the life years don't change because there is no change in background mortality, but due to the decrease in surgery, time to surgery, the utility after surgery improves as do the qualities. So my final slide is um, just that I hope that I've showed to you that the Simmer packages provides a relatively simple to highly flexible framework for implementing resource constrained DS models in R. And there's this set of basic functions that directly translate to the conceptual model structure. And I think that makes it a very powerful approach uh, for those that are new to DES and code based DES. And if we compare Simmer, uh, the Simmer package to base R, I think we can all agree that implementing such models with resource constraints in base R is quite challenging. So that's great, but Simmer can be a bit more challenged to manage in terms of big chunks of code for complex models, as well as for debugging. So having an incremental um, approach is really essential.
And if you don't need the resources, base R may be faster, but I still think that Simmer is very appealing because of those, those basic functions that translate to model structures. So thanks, that's it. I hope you find it helpful. Super, uh, Kuhn, very, very clear. Um, uh, lots of code in the presentation. I think that really shows us what's going on with the functions, so very, very useful. Um, just, uh, I think there was just maybe one question uh, I can see in the chat from, um, from Gabrielle. Uh, do you want to, are you able to unmute yourself and ask the question your, your, yourself? Uh, sure. Uh, thank you, Cohen. That was really good. Really good to see all the examples. Um, I just had a question on if you could set the seed for the patient, for the, each individual. So when you run, you run the model, you get the same results. But I think I saw in your code that you set the seed for the random generator at the beginning of the model. Yes, so that will give yeah. you the same results. Um, but then if you have different strategies, you may have sort of, so, well, I think the short answer is what I typically do is I simulate the random numbers up front. Um, mm -hmm. So, and then I sort of put that data frame into the simulation so that if I have different strategies, each individual has its sort of own okay. set of random numbers. Yeah, okay, thank you, that makes sense. Um, Okay, and how it also has a as a as a question there. How do you want to? Oh yeah, I was just asking Cohen. Um, in your experience, how many DES models in health economic applications do include these resource constraints? Is that is that a common thing to include, or is it usually ignored? It's usually ignored. I I know of very few who do. But I think now that these more advanced techniques become sort of well, more common at least, um, also maybe with, with the new generation of health economic modelers, I do expect that there will be an increase, but um, it's more a conceptual health technology assessment question, whether, whether we'll, how, how to, um, yeah, include or consider that, that um, resulting information in our decision making. So there's not much yet, but there may be more to come. Super. Um, I think if we have further questions, maybe they can be dealt with in the chat because we're running five minutes late and I, and I want to move on to... Uh, uh,